Hello everyone, uh, welcome to another Global Immuno Talk. I'm uh, connected with Dr. Matteo Yanacone, uh, 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 one of the co-organizers of Global Immuno Talks and our spectacular speaker today, Dr. Paul Cubes. Um, so uh, just uh, before Matteo introduced Paul, I would like to remind everyone that next Wednesday our global immuno speaker is Dr. David Brooks, so we hope that you can connect with us next Wednesday. And another reminder is that uh, in line with our intention to make these talks uh, global and egalitarian, we do the Q&A answers uh, via Twitter. Uh, so people that watch the talks in YouTube, uh, because they are in a different time zone, they can still participate in the discussions in an asynchronous manner. And so there is already a tweet in the Global Immunotalk account that says, ask questions for Dr. Paul Hughes here. You can ask throughout the talk, at the end of the talk, or after you, you watch the talk, record the talk in YouTube. So with, uh, without further ado, Matteo, I pass it to you so you can introduce Paul. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alina, and it is uh, truly uh, my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, my friend Paul Koops as today's uh, global immuno speaker. Uh, Paul uh, was born in the Czech Republic, uh, but moved to Canada as a very small boy. And he went to uh, Queen's University in uh, Kingston, Ontario, in Canada, where he got the PhD in cardiovascular physiology. He then moved to the US and did his postdoc at Louisiana State University in pathophysiology, examining sterile injury and the immune system. And he joined the faculty at the University of Calgary in 1991, and he was the founding director of the Snyder Institute for Chronic Disease, and he now leads the vice president's priority in infection, inflammation, and chronic diseases. Uh, Paul's lab started out uh, delineating the uh, molecular mechanisms um, underlying leukocyte recruitment at sites of inflammation, and gradually he extended his focus on uh, mechanisms of disease involving acute and chronic inflammation. He uses uh, very cleverly uh, dynamic imaging approaches to shed light on uh, leukocyte biology. And Paul's contribution to science has been tremendous, and I don't have time to go through all of them, but I just want to mention a few that I remember as particularly insightful. Um, he, um, for instance, delineated the complex sequence of danger signals uh, that guide neutrophils to sites of sterile inflammation, and he suggested that neutrophils do not necessarily die at the site of inflammation, but may re-enter the vasculature. He contributed to our understanding of the formation of neutrophil extracellular traps. He uncovered uh, one mechanism uh, whereby stroke induces immune suppression, namely the uh, profound behavioral changes in hepatic invariant natural killer T cells mediated by a noradrenergic neurotransmitter uh, following stroke. He, um, moreover, he identified a non-vascular route by which peritoneal macrophages invade visceral organs, and that is through the mesothelium. And he uncovered how uh, alveolar macrophages patrol lung alveoli and conceal bacteria from the immune system to maintain homeostasis. And finally, recently, he uh, proposed that some macrophages in mammals may retain some platelet or thrombocyte-like features promoting tissue repair, like, ha like it happens in other animal species. And for his contribution, uh, Paul received many awards, uh, including the uh, Canada's Researcher of the Year um, Award by the Canadian Institute of Health in 2011, and he is a member of the Royal Society of Canada. He has served as editorial board members for a Journal of Experimental Medicine and Journal of Clinical Investigation. And in addition to being a great scientist, Paul is a very entertaining speaker, so I very much look forward uh, to his talk. But before we start, Paul, uh, we always like to ask our uh, global immuno speaker um, a question um, um, that to get to know them a little better and to perhaps inspire the uh, next generation of, uh, of scientists. And so the question we would like to ask you is, what is the single most important advice that you would give to a young scientist uh, starting a career in immunology? Paul. You want me to answer that, do you? Uh, <laughs> I would say, uh, don't give up. Uh, without doubt, the most important trait, uh, if you don't give up, you'll do just fine. Uh, we all get rejected. We all get our grants rejected, our papers rejected. Uh, you have to dust off, stand up, 
and fight another day. And you can't let it uh, bother you. You got to get on with life. And I know it's very tough right now. It's very competitive. But I think that that would be my advice to people is don't give up. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> okay. So um, if you want, you can share your screen and take it away. Okay, uh, so you can see everything and my, everything's good. All right, sure. well, thank you very much for uh, the kind invitation. This is uh, truly an honor. Uh, and uh, what I would like to do today is actually, um, okay, hold on, I need to stop sharing. I'm sharing the wrong one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so what I'll tell you about today is some of the things that we've been doing in the area of uh, innate immunity. My title is, uh, why would a neutrophil biologist study macrophage? And so I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I use this sort of as a, as a way of introducing the topic. So as Matteo said, 30 years ago, we were using white light to watch how immune cells, and we had no idea what kind of immune cells were actually rolling, adhering, emigrating out of tissues using uh, translucent tissues like the cremaster and, thing, uh, and uh, mesentery. We then moved on to some pretty complex tissues. Uh, this is the kidney, of course. We looked at liver, lung, uh, to try, try to understand whether the same principles applied, and they don't. Every organ seems to have its own unique uh, characteristics. Um, and uh, as I said, I, I've always been very, very interested in neutrophil biology. And so we've used uh, microscopes, uh, initially pretty primitive microscopes, now a little bit more advanced uh, microscopes like spinning disk, like two photon systems that allow us now to begin to visualize what's happening in mice. Probably the most critically important thing is that these uh, mice have as little perturbation as possible, otherwise you get inflammation. And so we try and uh, do almost nothing to the mouse. We just do a laparotomy and then begin to visualize whatever organ we're interested in. We never take a cell out. We add antibodies into the mouse that bind to specific cells so we can watch them as they move around uh, the body. And we uh, like to use spinning disc because it, uh, it actually gives us uh, uh, much fat, it allows us to capture very fast events like bacteria got, getting caught out of the bloodstream. And so I want to begin with why do I study neutrophils? Because they're amazing cells. And so, you know, here's a, a simple model where we added a Li6G antibody fluorescently labeled so that it bound the neutrophil. And the neutrophils are here in green. We lower a thermal probe and kill about a thousand liver cells. And then we ask, do neutrophils notice this injury? And the answer is, very clearly over two hours. Yes, they do. They form this spectacular uh, aggregate. Uh, they move into this site. And we were very, very excited by this uh, observation. We were sure that if we could block this recruitment, we would uh, rescue or help repair the sterile injury. And of course, um, using imaging, uh, it really provides you with insights that you otherwise wouldn't have, and we were completely wrong. And so, in fact, when we watch these blue neutrophils run around this dead tissue, the red are dead blood vessels. They're collapsed, they're not perfused, and someone needs to get rid of them if you're going to build new tissue. And so you can see these blue neutrophils right here dismantling the red tissue. They've completely cleared the area here, and you can see some of the neutrophils now have some uh, vessel fragments inside of them. Uh, eventually they clear the area and they start forming these beautiful tunnels, if you will. And this is just the neutrophils creating, uh, creating um, uh, tunnels for the new revascularization. And so if you now uh, look at the revascularization, the liver has a tremendous capacity to regenerate. You cause this injury within a week, there's only a small tiny area left that hasn't been revascularized. If you deplete neutrophils with this 1A8 antibody, even for just 24 to 48 hours, uh, seven days later, the injury is still lagging behind. It's not repairing as effectively. So the neutrophils are critical for this function. And 
you know, we all thought, uh, especially from infection models, that these neutrophils would now die at this site. So they would uh, form a pus ball, die, and macrophage would come in and eat them up. And in fact, in sterile injury, that's not the case. So we have a Lysix-G specific photoactivatable mouse. So a mouse where just the neutrophils glow when we shine UV light. And so inside this injury, we now photoactivate a bunch of neutrophils and then watch what happens. And here's the injury. Green are neutrophils and red are healthy tissue. And you can see these neutrophils at the end of the day, they actually migrate back into these uh, patent blood vessels, and they again leave. And you can see them line up one after another, after another, and after another, and they all leave this tissue. And so you can imagine that this, you know, was very exciting. They were home back to bone marrow, all kinds of interesting ha things happen in the bone marrow, and we're studying that now. And so the question is, why would I ever bother to study macrophage, right? Neutrophil is it. Um, and it kind of, you know, I have twins, two and a half years old. And so some of these stories are pretty, uh, pretty uh, prevalent around the household. And this is, of course, about somebody who won't try something new. Uh, this is me. Uh, and I don't like macrophage, and I'm not going to study them. And uh, every time I gave this talk, people asked me about macrophage. And so I started, uh, I started uh, asking questions about uh, why, uh, why should we study macrophage? Uh, if you read even very recent reviews on macrophage, these macrophage are embedded in tissues. They're sessile, they do not move. Uh, so there's uh, really no need to image them if they're not moving. Uh, all you need is a little bit of histology and probably a strong coffee so that uh, you don't fall asleep. Uh, they also seem to maintain homeostasis. Uh, and I will say that's like watching paint dry, isn't it? So again, not very exciting and when, things get tough, uh, many of the models that people study, the macrophage disappear, and now you get bone marrow derived monocytes come in and take their place. So this was not all that uh, exciting to me, but having said that, I'm glad we did start studying the macrophage because this first point in a number of cases is completely wrong. Uh, macrophage can move around and I'll show you a spectacular example of that. And then the other thing, uh, I won't have a chance to talk about homeostasis, but it's really quite interesting. Macrophage can move from alveolus to alveolus, constantly patrolling for anything that we breathe in. And uh, I will also show you an example of where a monocyte will come in and replace macrophage in a, quite a, uh, an interesting manner. So it, it's kind of interesting, the fetal liver, you get these monocyte-like uh, cells that leave the fetal liver and they seed all the different organs throughout the body. And if, you, and if you now look, for example, in the lungs, molecules like CSF2 uh, will activate certain transcription factors, in this case, PPAR uh, gamma, and you get uh, the production of these very specific alveolar macrophage that live on the epithelium. Uh, of the alveoli. And similarly, uh, other transcription factors are activated to form other kinds of cells. The peritoneal cavity is no exception. It's, a, it's actually a tissue, even though we call it a cavity. It surrounds all the different visceral organs and it's chock full of macrophage. And in this particular case, uh, the, uh, the, the cavity macrophage in this regard uh, C-retinoic acid and other factors, they activate GATA6, and that causes these cells to become these GATA6 positive peritoneal macrophage. Uh, they are these large peritoneal macrophage. They come from yolk sac progenitors, and they self-replicate and renew every so often um, and live within the peritoneal cavity. But 80% of all macrophage in the peritoneal cavity are these large peritoneal macrophage. The small peritoneal macrophage come from monocytes and only about 20% of them are these small peritoneal macrophage. What regulates this 80 to 20% uh, ratio is uh, still not entirely clear. Now, um, I've already shown you that when we injure the liver, uh, the neutrophils come charging in within about uh, one to two hours, you see this spectacular recruitment. And I had two new postdocs join me, uh, Jing Wang and Joel Zindel. 
and they both wanted to study macrophage. Um, and so I told them, you know, fill your boots, go ahead and do that, but you'll never see anything like this. Uh, and so Jin came to me after her first experiment and said, Dr. Koobs, I know we obliterate everything inside this little injury site. And yet within an hour, I'm seeing F480 positive macrophage. In fact, at 12 hours, this entire engine is totally covered by these uh, F480 uh, positive macrophage. Now, we'd already looked at monocytes and saw they don't get recruited for at least 24 to 36 hours. And so I told her there's no way this could be happening. Um, what Ching did though, is she said, look, when I look at our monocyte reporter mice shown here in red, yellow, green, uh, different flavors of monocytes, none of them that are being recruited into this injury site actually have anything to do with these macrophages that are getting recruited. And so this was quite interesting. This meant that these macrophages were somehow uh, coming in as bona fide macrophage. <clears throat> if you now try and block their recruitment with pertussis toxin, uh, uh, so block all of the chemokine uh, receptors, that didn't work at all. Nor did blocking all the uh, integrins, they simply do not affect the recruitment of these cells. And what's interesting is that Jin came to me and she said, they must be coming from somewhere else besides the vasculature. I never see F480 uh, cells coming in via the vasculature. Um, and then she told me something interesting. She said, there's 20,000 papers on peritoneal macrophage and maybe half a dozen try and address what they do in vivo. The rest of them are all about uh, signaling after these macrophages are harvested. And these macrophages are very easy to ha harvest because they just apparently sit around in the peritoneum. <clears throat> now, to track these macrophages was difficult, but uh, a number of groups, Metzitoff, Taylor, uh, Randolph, all published at the same time these papers that said that GATA6 was a critical factor for these large peritoneal macrophage. And so we stained for the macrophage that we were seeing that were covering our injury site. And we were surprised to find that every single one of them was GATA6 positive. You can see the Cooper cells sitting in the healthy tissues are GATA6 negative. It's only these peritoneal macrophage that are GATA6 positive. <clears throat> We tried to image and our first attempts failed miserably, but as I told you at the beginning, just don't give up. And so what you can see here is us looking inside the peritoneal cavity. We're not able to open the peritoneal cavity because otherwise these cells seem to disappear. And so we tried to image through the peritoneal cavity and you can see here's the border of a tissue. And the one thing this video did show us is that these macrophages are not sessile. They are not still. They are moving at incredibly fast rates, so fast that we're having trouble capturing it. This is probably the same macrophage just being captured one, one, uh, uh, one, one uh, frame at a time. And so uh, these macrophages are always flowing around in the peritoneum. Uh, Joel Zindel, uh, a surgeon um, improved on this imaging. What he did was he took a little pouch, formed a little tiny pouch that was still open to the rest of the peritoneum. And now he could watch through the linea alba, the cartilage that separates your six pack down the middle, of course. Uh, and these macrophages, uh, we, we could now image shown here. And what you can see is these red macrophages, and here's the injury site. And what you can see is the spectacular recruitment of these macrophages, okay? And that happened in exactly 13 minutes. So these macrophages get to this site very, very rapidly. You can see that again. And this is imaging now right through the, uh, the wall of the abdomen. <clears throat> and as I said, the macrophage actually arrive at about uh, five minutes. They could form this aggregate and then they uh, really reach a peak within 10 minutes max. Uh, if you close the pouch, so there's no flow, there's lots of macrophage in there, but there's no flow, they don't get recruited. These macrophages depend on that flow to catch, grab, 
and uh, attach. And this is quite disappointing for any neutrophil biologist because while these macrophages are already working very hard, you can see the neutrophil still hasn't woken up. And it's only at about 40 to 50 minutes that we start seeing neutrophils enter this injury. 60 minutes, they're now being recruited. And you can see over the next couple of hours, they get there. But the macrophage is actually the cell that gets there first. <clears throat> uh, we thought this looked almost like platelets. Uh, and so what we did was we just injured a tissue where a vessel was involved as well as the tissue. And as fast as the platelets got there and plugged up the vessel injury, these macrophage got there and covered the tissue injury. So the two cell types seem to arrive pretty much at the same time and do exactly the same thing. In fact, uh, if we used a platelet aggregometer. So you take platelets, you put them in an aggregometer, and they, if you give an agonist, they all start aggregating, shown in this line right here. You could actually take macrophage, stick them into this aggregometer. They actually spontaneously will aggregate. That's their nature outside the parent meal cavity. And if you add ATP, you can increase this a little bit. So these macrophage spontaneously uh, aggregate uh, in these aggregometers. Now, we tried to figure out how could we disrupt this recruitment? How could we disrupt this aggregation? And we tried many, many different things. We got pretty desperate. We even tried to deplete platelets, thinking maybe there's some platelets inside the peritoneal cavity, allowing macrophage to attach to each other and form these aggregates. That was not the case. Integrins had no effect. Selectin surprisingly had no effect. These macrophage uh, are totally covered in P-selectin, one of the selectins found on platelets, or the selectin found on platelets, and yet blocking selectins had no effect at all. And you can see we tried many different perturbations, and none of these actually affected this macrophage recruitment. Now, uh, Gwen Randolph had this very nice paper in JEM, in 2019, where she, uh, she and others have also shown this, added heparin to the peritoneal cavity and could, uh, could disrupt at least the macrophage aggregation induced by, for example, infectious agents. And so we wondered whether heparin could actually affect uh, the biology of our uh, system. And when we added heparin, you can see that this large aggregate didn't form. And so heparin was pretty good at blocking this aggregation. What was interesting was that uh, heparin, of course, blocks coagulation, but it also is a very charged molecule. And when we added other coag uh, anticoagulants, like herudin, uh, various other molecules, we could not block this, uh, this recruitment, this aggregation. And so it wasn't the uh, coagulant properties of heparin that were working. And so we wondered whether it was some other effect. Now, uh, I love this quote, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And uh, I kind of forced uh, uh, a surgeon to start thinking about sea urchins, which was a challenge in itself. Joel Zindel started thinking about sea urchins. They are probably one of the most primitive life forms with a cavity. That cavity is, uh, is actually filled with coelomocytes. These are macrophage slash platelet-like cells and when the sea urchins, if somebody, some a seal, for example, bites and punctures this, or if you do it in the lab, these coelomocytes actually come to that area and plug it up, just like we were seeing in our peritoneal cavity. What's interesting about these sea urchins is that they have about a thousand different scavenger receptors. And these receptors are unique in that they actually recognize charge, they recognize various uh, forms. Uh, and, so, uh, and so you can imagine that uh, anything foreign might be recognized by these scavenger receptors. And so these cells get recruited and plug up any perturbation. Humans have much fewer scavenger receptors. And in fact, we checked all of these for biology and in fact found that Marco, with some contribution of MSR1, uh, were important 
in allowing this recruitment of these cells. And so for the first time, we were able to inhibit this macrophage recruitment uh, by targeting a specific molecule, Marco. And in fact, there's a very good inhibitor of some of these scavenger receptors, poly I, and it actually works even better at blocking this recruitment to the surface of this injury site. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge Joel for doing all of this work, for tolerating me, making him uh, think about sea urchins and other things, and looking at these uh, macrophage as they attach to the surface. Uh, what I'd like to tell you now is what these macrophage are doing there. Okay, And this isn't trivial because a paper recently came out that said that they're doing absolutely nothing there. Uh, other papers have recently come out that say that they may be affecting cancer growth. Uh, Gwen's paper shows that they may be uh, affecting infection. Uh, they may help in repair, and this is something that I'll show you. And they may also cause some untoward effects that I'll share with you. So what is the function of these macrophage? Well, if you take a look at these macrophages, they attach to the injury site. They very quickly uh, begin to replicate. And you can see that here, KI67 positive cells, many of them are starting to replicate at the injury site. These peritoneal macrophages seem to live in a null state. You couldn't describe them as M1 or M2, uh, but very quickly after attaching to that injury site, they start uh, producing CD273, CD206, arginase, they start becoming uh, repair and or, if you will, for lack of a better word, M2-like in nature. This happens pretty quickly because within hours, you're starting to see upregulation of CD206, CD273, arginase. So these cells are very quickly adapting to that environment and becoming a repair-like macrophage. You can watch these macrophages, and we're looking from the bottom up on an inverted microscope and they look like they're probing. If we now open up the green channel, what you can see is this dead cell here uh, filled with cytox green and watch these red uh, macrophage sitting on top of it slowly dismantle this uh, dead cell. And this will go on and all of these dead cells begin to be dismantled. You can see this over time. Uh, and then what you'll see is, uh, and we don't have time to watch this, so full completion. But what happens is that these punctate dead cells now all get lysed. You get this beautiful chromatin covering the injury site. And uh, as you know, histones are antimicrobial. And so this chromatin covers the area and we think it may protect it from uh, any, any other perturbation. If you remove the macrophage from the system, then what you see is this punctate formation. You don't get the chromatin. You don't get those initial uh, dismantling of these cells. And what you end up with is under normal conditions, you get very nice regrowth, revascularization. If you deplete these macrophage, you prevent that revascularization from happening. Now, these perineal macrophage can respond to various injuries. Uh, for example, if you take carbon tetrachloride and feed it once to, to mice, you end up with these small abscesses uh, of dead cells. And this is not our paper, this is somebody else's paper that showed this very nicely. And when we tried it, we observed these areas of death. And what you can see is that wherever we uh, looked, these peritoneal macrophage had, uh, had attached to and sometimes infiltrated. And you could see these macrophage actually crossing the mesothelium and moving into the tissue. And this is quite controversial and not in every model that we see them infiltrate into tissue, but at least in, in this particular model, we do see some of these macrophage uh, entering these uh, small abscesses. And as deep as we can go with our two photon system, we see them there. And if, if these macrophage aren't around, these mice do, uh, do not do well and we have to sacrifice them. So uh, if with a more profound injury like this, the macrophage are critical. Now these macrophage shown here actually reach peak levels and then it looked to us like they were disappearing and that's not the case. Uh, Dr. Turley, uh, as well as us, we published together uh, in two different uh, uh, manuscripts that actually uh, these macrophage lose their GATA6 
And so now what you have is a system where these macrophages are still there. They're just not expressing GATA6. And I won't go into great detail about this, but we had to make a very uh, difficult mouse uh, to study these peritoneal macrophages selectively. GATA6 is expressed on many parenchymal cells. Uh, Lysem is expressed on uh, numerous different uh, myeloid cells. And so we made a Lysem Cre GATA6 flipase uh, with a tamoxifen uh, added to the system, uh, sensitive uh, to, to tamoxifen. And so now we have this permanently labeled GATA6 peritoneal macrophage when we get tamoxifen. Uh, we've actually struggled to really get these cells to turn on uh, TD tomato. Uh, we're only at about 25% efficiency. But I can tell you now that under these conditions, what we can see is these macrophage infiltrate these tissues. You can see them here as these uh, F480 positive, but also GATA6 positive cells. And at seven days, they are still there. And you can see that they're now taking on very interesting shapes. They're becoming a uh, very large macrophage, perhaps adapting to this tissue. And we're now wondering whether these cells will become uh, one of the resident tissue cells in the liver. Um, I just wanna show you that if you just look at these macrophage at seven days, you can see that a, there are a fair number of them there. And so we're trying to understand what these cells become. <clears throat> it's not all good news. Um, and these macrophage are primed to heal and they'll heal by whatever means possible. And so it's interesting that in this particular case, if you have an operation, there is a 4% chance that if your operation, even if it goes well, you will develop something called uh, adhesions. And these are just these uh, collagenous structures uh, that actually can attach to one organ, then another organ, and these peritoneal adhesions actually are a huge problem. There's no effective treatment. It's the number one cause of life-threatening small bowel obstruction, number one cause of secondary infertility. And, uh, and so uh, we really don't understand how these adhesions are formed. And when we started watching inside the peritoneal cavity, these fluorescent macrophage, sometimes these aggregates took on these sort of lengthy uh, structures and they would start attaching from one organ to the next. And we could actually watch this formation and over time, they would now attach and form this structure. Uh, we think that mesothelium then begins to grow over top and we end up with a structure that actually turns out to be these collagenous structures. And if we now block uh, either the macrophage, deplete the macrophage, use GATA6 deficient mice, or add poly I, the, the molecule that blocks this aggregate formation, we can reduce the number of adhesions that are formed. Um, the peritoneal cavity is not the only cavity. The pericardial cavity is chock full of macrophage. Okay, as is the pleural cavity, for example. And there's lots of these GATA6 macrophage inside the mouse peri uh, pericardial cavity. About a third of all cells inside that pericardium are these macrophages. There's lots of other uh, immune cells inside these cavities that dominated by these GATA6 positive macrophage. Similarly, in humans, the pericardium also has these GATA6 positive macrophage. And what's interesting is uh, uh, Justin Denisette did this study with help from uh, Dr. O'Shea, uh, John O'Shea, uh, and we showed that heart versus pericardial macrophage were very, very different. But peritoneal macrophage and these pericardial macrophage were nearly identical. And so these cavity macrophage live in all the different organs, uh, cavities, they can actually attach to the surface of an injured organ, and then they can perform, we believe, certain repair functions. So I hope that you agree with me that these macrophage are not sessile, they don't just sit there, they're not just, uh, uh, you know, you can't just use histology. Uh, in fact, they were one of the more challenging cells watch 
uh, move around the body. Um, what I want to tell you now is a second story, uh, completely unpublished. Uh, we've, uh, we've actually been working very hard on this story. And uh, it's actually um, uh, what happens when you have a chronic disease and what happens to macrophage. And so um, I want to start by saying that there's this beautiful paper in Immunity in 2019 uh, by, from Dr. Guillaume's group, uh, Bonardel et al., and uh, you can see that these orange macrophage in the liver, these are called Kupfer cells. They reach out and touch the vasculature. They reach out and touch a hepatocyte. And this green guy is a fibroblast-like cell, a stellate cell. They reach out and touch the stellate cell. And all three of these cells provide important signals that tell this uh, resonant Kupfer cell to be a Kupfer cell. If you deplete, and kill these Cooper cells, monocytes come in, they reach out, touch the hepatocyte, touch the stellate cell, touch the uh, endothelium, and start becoming these Cooper cells again, and very quickly take on a Cooper cell-like phenotype. And so this is a beautiful system that really highlights how a Cooper cell manages to get its identity. Now, we've been studying these Cooper cells for many years, actually, and they live in the liver microcirculation. Uh, they sit inside these tiny sinusoids. Blood flow comes from the gut, so there's always some microbial products, microbes that circulate through these sinusoids. They're quickly filtered by the macrophage that live inside the vasculature. And you can see that here. Here are the blue sinusoids. Uh, here in purple are these beautiful macrophages. You can see this one reaching out, uh, touching a hepatocyte. There's another one up here that reaches out and touches a hepatocyte. And so you can see these macrophage, they live inside primarily the liver sinusoids, but do certainly make contact with other cells. And their primary job is to filter. And so in the next slide, I'll show you what happens if you add fluorescent staph aureus they very rapidly take up these uh, pathogens extremely efficiently. And this is important because if you get a bloodstream infection, it's not the spleen, kidney, lung, or blood that I actually uh, get rid of the infection, it is the liver. And so these Kupfer cells are critical for this function. And in fact, you know, people keep telling me, well, the neutrophil is actually what gets rid of bacterium blood. Here's a neutrophil chasing after a bacterium. Poor fellow can't catch either one, so he leaves one behind, keeps running. These are all red blood cells. You don't dare turn on flow because then the bacteria would float away. And so that's the only way you can capture this neutrophil and see it actually catch uh, a bacterium. These aren't our videos. This is from 1950s by David Rogers. Uh, and I don't think our immune system is this inefficient. In fact, if you add bacteria, Kupfer cells take care of this problem instantaneously. They catch these bacteria, they phagocytose them, and destroy them very, very effectively. And if you poison the system, if you add quadrinic liposomes, get, get the Kupfer cells will take up these liposomes, die, and now you have a system where the sinusoids don't have these red Kupfer cells. And so now there's no catching of bacteria whatsoever. And under these conditions, you see no catching. These mice die very quickly. Now, the reason these macrophages catch bacteria so effectively is because aside from having the well-known complement receptors, they also have a complement receptor, Crig, that can catch underflow conditions. And this was first described by the Genentech group uh, in cells showing that they actually, uh, uh, that underflow conditions, Listeria, staph, could be very effectively caught by this complement receptor and uh, eradicating the bacteria. And so we obtain these mice from them, the Crig deficient mice, and again, show very profound impairment in catching of bacteria. This Crig molecule can also attach not just to complement, uh, but also to LTA and other pathogen-associated molecular patterns. So <clears throat> Dr. Moritz Peisler joined my group and he said, you know, Dr. Koobs, that's all very interesting, but this is what my patient looks like. 
and he is a hepatologist and he deals with chronic liver disease. And the disease is, um, is, um, uh, progresses quite slowly. Uh, you end up with fibrosis and ultimately cirrhosis. And many of these pe patients live for many years with a very uh, injured liver. And uh, what, uh, uh, what we wanted to figure out, what Moritz wanted to figure out is uh, what happens to the macrophage. And so we really had to find a model that mimicked the human condition. And in the human condition, one gets very large uh, collaterals growing uh, both inside and outside the liver because many of the sinusoids become occluded or very, very thin. And so blood flow has to be accommodated. And giving chronic carbon tetrafluoride actually kills a lot of cells. And what happens is uh, the sinusoids become fi uh, fibrosed and so you get thickening and narrowing of those sinusoids. And now these large collaterals start growing and you can see them really, uh, uh, really nicely here at eight weeks. By 12 weeks, the liver is a real mess and yet the mouse stays alive, which is really quite amazing. If you perfuse FITC albumin into a healthy uh, liver, you see the beautiful sinusoidal structure. There are a few larger uh, post-sinusoidal vessels. Uh, However, nothing compared to the thyrotic liver where you have these huge uh, collateral vessels. And so you can see that the sinusoids narrow dramatically and this causes these uh, collateral vessels uh, to grow uh, to be quite, uh, quite large. And in these sinusoids, in a healthy liver, you can see these Kupfer cells reaching out, having their pseudopods uh, out, uh, out reaching to all the different cell types, and that creates their identity. Uh, in a carbon tetrafluoride treated mouse, you can see that these uh, guys look stuck. They kind of look like this. And so they can't reach out to anything. This is not my dog, I didn't do this. Um, and so what's interesting is that these Kupfer cells actually they begin to lose their key molecules because they can't reach out to their surrounding. And so many of the cells lose their Krig. Many of their cells, essentially all cells, lose TIM4 in these fibrotic situations. Uh, we don't think monocytes are coming in to replace them. We just think that these Kupfer cells are losing some of their identity. And you can see that these Kupfer cells in a healthy liver catch bacteria. So you can see bacteria caught in the fibrotic liver what you see, and if you watch these two sausages right here, and you insert uh, uh, bac bacteria, you can see this guy catches a bacteria, hangs on to it, tries to hang on, and then it disappears again on them. And so we think that this, this system uh, is now impaired. It can't catch bacteria. But remember, I told you, patients live for a very long time. And when Moritz challenged this system, with five times 10 to the seventh staph aureus. This is barely, uh, this is about as much as a wild type mouse can tolerate. So none die, but boy, do they get sick. In the carbon tetrachloride mouse, 80% of these mice survive, which was really quite impressive. We were quite surprised by that. And in fact, uh, the liver still has tremendous catching ability. <clears throat> and so, here is a control mouse and here's a carbon tetrafluoride uh, uh, treated mouse. Clearly the fibrotic liver doesn't catch as many bacteria, but the mouse survives. If you deplete all Kupfer cells, then they don't catch anything. And then the mice don't survive. So something's ha happening in the system to compensate. Here's a healthy liver and you can see that these macrophage uh, the Kupfer cells live in the sinusoids. Here's a slightly larger vessel and there's no macrophage in there at all. There's no point because these macrophages would be too small to try and catch anything in the, in the blood flow of these larger vessels. However, when we looked at the fibrotic liver, these large vessels were now getting clogged with F480 positive macrophage. And when we look, Here's a single macrophage right here. Here's another single macrophage. It was not unusual to see these structures, these gigantic F480 positive cells. And you can see them in each of these large vessels. 
if you watch them, they are absolutely spectacular at catching bacteria. And you can see them here catching about 20 bacteria in the span of a, a second or two. So these large macrophages are really, really good. And Moritz being a good German coined the term uber Cooper cells. Now they express all the molecules you might expect of a Cooper cell. They have huge amounts of Krig, actually more Krig than uh, regular Cooper cells. Uh, and they catch bacteria amazingly well. And areas with these giant cells caught lots of bacteria, areas without caught very few bacteria. And these macrophages acidify the bacteria very, very effectively, phagocytose them and kill them. If you harvest these cells, here's a single Kupfer cell. It rounds up once it's outside its environment, single nucleus. And it was not hard at all to identify these giant cells, multiple nuclei. It looked to us like they had a single membrane. Um, so uh, we're not sure that they're completely fused into a single cell or whether they might be some compartments, but we're calling them giant cells. Uh, if you take a look at EM, you can see this one membrane surrounding multiple nuclei inside these vessels. And so while a healthy liver, the Cooper cells live in the sinusoids, they catch these bacteria, no problem. Uh, you can imagine that if all you had was a single Cooper cell sitting in these large collateral vessels in a fibrotic liver, uh, they would have a greatly diff much more difficult time catching these bacteria. And so that's not the way the system works. It compensates. And now what you get is these giant cells that are very, very capable of bacteria. Now, you know, the reviewers of this paper have told us that this is theor theoretically impossible. And I really like this uh, Robert Hanlon uh, quote, everything's theoretically impossible until it is done. And so, what I would say is that, uh, that um, I'll, I'll show you how this is done now. Uh, if you take a look at four weeks of fibrosis, the monocyte recruitment, the CX3CR1 positive monocytes shown here in green, fill those larger vessels. And you can see that here. Here's a large vessel. Here are the Kupfer cells. And here are the monocytes. And they're coming in and they're attaching in these larger vessels. And we have a CX3CR1 CRE-ER mouse where actually it's slightly more sophisticated. It actually is green uh, and turns red when we add tamoxifen. So we can now see at what time point when monocytes turn red, will they become these giant cells? And when we give tamoxifen, tamoxifen at four weeks, but not before that, let's say one week before, you see that these giant cells are all red. They've all come from that monocyte pool. They're not at all being contributed to by Kupfer cells. So if you add PKH, these Kupfer cells can actually take up this particulate matter and store it in their vesicles for weeks and weeks and weeks. And you can see them here, Kupfer cells in a carbon tetrachloride treated mouse. These giant cells have no evidence that they've come from Kupfer cells. So we think these are monocyte derived and they form these giant cells in, a, in obviously an attempt to eradicate bacteria. How are these giant cells formed? Well, in the bone marrow, for, for example, Rankel is a very important molecule, not in this system. Uh, Rankel played no role at all. We still got pretty much the same uh, level of giant cell formation. Uh, we went data mining and some RNA-seq uh, data sets. This, this uh, um, um, data set from Henderson was spectacular. It did cirrhotic human livers, mouse livers. And to make a long story short, we identified a number of molecules that were highly upregulated on the monocytes infiltrating fibrotic livers, CD44, CD9, uh, CD36. And I can tell you that each of these played a different role. CD9 had no role. Uh, however, CD44 was critical. And it was critical because it's the receptor for hyaluronin. Hyaluronin covers all of these um, uh, sinusoids and functions as an important adhesion molecule for immune cell recruitment. You can see that these larger vessels have absolutely no 
hotter on and under normal healthy conditions. But in the fibrotic liver, these monocytes adhere via CD44 inside these vessels. And in a CD44 knockout, you get very, very few of these monocytes being recruited and you get almost no giant cells at all. And these mice actually, without the giant cells, they can't catch bacteria as well. And they rapidly succumb to an infection if we give them staph aureus. Now, Ron Germain had a beautiful paper showing that the microbiome actually dictates where a for cell adheres within the sinusoids. And so I just wanna tell you very quickly that we think microbiome also plays a role in these fibrotic livers. Uh, the gut gets a little bit more leaky in these fibrotic livers. And so these collateral vessels are now seeing a little bit more of the microbiome and we see upregulation of the adhesion molecules in these larger vessels. Live one, for example, a ligand for uh, hyaluronin and, uh, and also a, a CD44 uh, hyaluronin live one could form a bridge, and that's where exactly the F480 giant cells adhere. <clears throat> if you treat these mice with antibiotics, if you use germ-free mice, what you see is no monocyte recruitment, and you get absolutely no giant cell formation. So these monocytes, uh, there's an activation of the endothelium in these larger vessels through the microbiome, these monocytes come in, they adhere, they fill these uh, large vessels, and then somehow become these giant cells. And the somehow is based on CD36. CD36 is a key fusion molecule, and actually here's a wild type mouse with this cluster. And here what you see in a CD36 knockout mouse is Crig positive, F480 positive, uh, monocyte derived macrophage, however, these guys don't fuse, and so they're individual cells. And the important thing here is if you inject bacteria, these individual cells cannot catch bacteria in these larger vessels. You require the fusion and formation of these uh, giant cells to be able to catch bacteria. Now, you know, we've been criticized for this model. We need to show it in another model. Unfortunately, this is really the only model uh, that really models the human condition. And so the question is, does this happen in humans? And I will say, yes, it does. Here's, uh, here's uh, one of these giant cells from a cirrhotic human liver. Uh, we can actually see these giant cells inside uh, uh, a human uh, cirrhotic liver here. And uh, one can actually see this uh, Crick positive multinucleated cell, and we see it in viral, alcoholic, diet-induced uh, liver disease. So it seems to happen in all these diseases. Now, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, as I've already told you. And we think that uh, obviously it's hard to implicate these cells forming these giant cells uh, because of alcohol or because of uh, high fatty diet, because that hasn't existed for a, very, uh, for a long time. But certainly we have evolved in the presence of various liver trophic viruses. And these viruses we now know also cause these giant cells. And maybe we've evolved anytime the liver gets injured to actually form these giant cells uh, to help us uh, eradicate bacteria that manage to get through the sinusoids uh, and move through these collateral vessels. And so I'll stop there uh, and I'll just say, I, I, I do, I do like macrophage. And I'd be happy uh, to, uh, to finish here. And I thank all of my collaborators and the funding. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paul. What a wonderful talk. Thank you uh, for educating us about uh, macrophaging. I definitely didn't need a strong coffee. It was very, very engaging, your, your talk. Thank you so, so much for sharing your published and unpublished results uh, here. Um, so I will uh, share again uh, the slide where um, we explain, is it showing there? Uh, we explain here how to ask questions for Paul. 
And uh, remember, there is a tweet in the Global Immunotalks account that says, ask questions for Dr. Paul Hughes here. Reply to that tweet with your question and mention in the hashtag Global Immuno. And Paul uh, will answer those questions using his own lab account, Cubes Lab. And so please take the opportunity to interact with Paul in YouTube, uh, sorry, in Twitter. Uh, after the live talk or if you watch the recorded talk in YouTube. So thank you so much, Paul, again, for, for sharing uh, your research in this format. And uh, everyone, I hope you can join next week for David Brooks Global Immuno Talk. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Bye, Paul. <laughs>